This is our third and final podcast in our series on connective tissue. In this podcast, I'd like to talk about connective tissue cells. When we talk about connective tissue cells, we either talk about resident cells or wandering cells. Most of the cells I'm going to talk to you about in this podcast are resident cells. So cells like fibroblasts, macrophages, mast cells, adipocytes are considered resident cells of connective tissue, plasma cells, which I'll talk to you about for a few minutes in this podcast, as well as the other leukocytes are considered wandering cells in that those cells come into connective tissue. As I said, we'll talk a little bit about plasma cells in this podcast. We'll talk about the other leukocytes when we talk about blood cells in later podcasts. Cells like chondrocytes and osteocytes and their related cells in tissues like cartilage and bone, respectively, and adult stem cells can be considered resident cells of connective tissue. The first cell we'll consider is the fibroblast. The fibroblast is considered the definitive cell of connective tissue. Oftentimes it's the only cell that one sees in certain types of connective tissue, especially like dense, regular connective tissue. Fibroblasts are often spindle-shaped or stellate-shaped. They can be amoeboid in that they can move around a little bit within the connective tissue, and they can be contractile because they have abundant actin content in their cytoplasm. Fibroblasts play an important role in the wound healing process. Fibroblasts are synthetically active cells, and indeed fibroblasts secrete the majority of material that's considered part of the extracellular matrix within connective tissue. Fibroblasts also have the potential for mitotic activity, and some authors even suggest that fibroblasts might be an, a multipotent stem cell. Oftentimes we confuse fibroblasts and fibrocytes and we use the terms interchangeably. The fibroblast is actually the immature cell in connective tissue. It's synthetically active. The fibrocyte is synthetically less active. It is the mature cell in connective tissue. And as I said, we often use the terms for these cells interchangeably. Here are some fibroblasts in connective tissue. This is probably the submucosa in the GI tract. That's an important that you know that right now. But you can see the nuclei of these fibroblasts and then the surrounding extracellular material. Another view of fibroblasts, I'm not quite sure where this connective tissue is, but you can see the nuclei of the cells. You can also see at these white arrowheads, these long spindly-like projections of the cytoplasm of the fibroblast. And remember this cartoon that I showed you, fibroblasts do often have these spindle-like projections. And that's what's showing up in this image. Macrophages are another cell type found in connective tissue. They're monocyte derived. Macrophages in the lung are given the special name dust cell. Macrophages in the liver are called Kupfer cells. Uh, we know of Langerhans cells. These are macrophages in the skin. Macrophages enter connective tissue as monocytes from the peripheral blood. They mature in the connective tissue. Macrophages elaborate lots of lysosomes. They have phagocytic activity. Here you can see some macrophages in this image. The granules within the cells are suggesting phagocytic activity. Macrophages live for a relatively long time within connective tissue. They're amoeboid phagocytes, which means they can move around in connective tissue. They function to clean up damaged cells, spent cells, often foreign materials, maybe bacteria. Macrophages can respond to acute and chronic inflammation. They can respond as a result of infections or maybe in response to tumor development. Uh, macrophages are also considered antigen processing cells. They can enhance immune response by secreting different cytokines, and they can attract lymphocytes to sites of infection. 
Now, the plasma cell is a B lymphocyte derived cell. Here we're showing it in an electron microscopic view, and here on the light micrograph you can see numerous plasma cells. Plasma cells are an end stage cell. They produce antibodies within local regions of connective tissue. Plasma cells are very common in the loose connective tissue of organs like the GI tract, the respiratory tract, the urinary tract. They're common in organs that are engaged in a lot of secretion, like the mammary gland or the salivary glands. Basically, plasma cells provide antibodies to glandular secretions and also add antibodies to the lumen of the GI tract. Plasma cells have a very characteristic morphology at the electron microscopic level. They have this clock-faced nucleus, that is where there's clumps of heterochromatin that are appear to coalesce around the periphery of the nuclear envelope. There's lots of rough ER in the plasma cell cytoplasm. At the light microscopic level, the cytoplasm is very basophilic because of that content of rough ER. And a lot of times you can see a Golgi halo, as I'm highlighting here, at the light microscopic level in plasma cells. Mast cells are also another connective tissue cell. These are bone marrow derived cells. Indeed, mast cells and basophils, which are found in peripheral blood, are thought to mature from a common progenitor cell. Mast cells are very common in loose connective tissue. You find them near blood vessels. They're often just deep to the mucosal surfaces when there's an epithelium associated with the connective tissue. Mast cells have abundant cytoplasm with very large metachromatic granules. These granules contain substances like histamine, trypsin, chymase, maybe heparin, various types of interleukins, signaling molecules like cytokines, maybe tumor necrosis factor. Here are some mast cells. At the light microscopic level, you can see these cells chocked full of granules. Mast cells are very important in association with uh, allergic reactions. Uh, they coordinate responses of other cells to infections. They can be involved in antigen processing and wound healing processes. They can secrete chemotactic substances to allow other cells to come into connective tissue. This is a cartoon that looks at interactions between mast cells and other cells in connective tissue. So here I've drawn a couple of mast cells. Here's a plasma cell, lymphocytes, and some neutrophils. So you can imagine some various scenarios. IgE is, of course, an antibody, and mast cells will bind IgE. If there's a secondary immune response where there's a lot of IgE circulating, mast cells can bind that IgE, and sometimes you can get what's called an explosive degranulation as the mast cells essentially rupture and release all of these granules. And this is very prominent in allergic reactions and sometimes even allergic reactions that go to anaphylaxis. And as you know, anaphylaxis can be a life-threatening condition. As a result of the release of these granules, you often see smooth muscle contraction. There's lots of capillary leakage and edema oftentimes. There's a lot of inflammation as other white blood cells are drawn into the connective tissue. It's also thought that nerve endings might come very close to mast cells and perhaps signal mast cells. If this individual is under a certain amount of stress, the mast cells might release some of these granules, which may cause a minor allergic reaction. You might see this as symptoms presenting as a rash or hives. These mast cell granules can also stimulate lymphocytes to enhance immune responses. The mast cell granules that are released may be involved in wound healing. So for example, histamine, heparin might stimulate angiogenesis. Substances like chymase, tryptase might be involved in processes like arthrosclerosis. So if you think of something like wound healing, these substances might induce angiogenesis. They might be mitogenic for epithelial cells and connective tissue cells. Perhaps they're involved in degradation of 
clots that form after a wound with respect to arthrosclerosis. Some of these uh, substances that are released from mast cell granules might stimulate LDL deposition, especially in the walls of arteries. These granules might activate macrophages. Macrophages, when there's arthrosclerosis, will tend to phagocytose a lot of the LDL-type particles. They might transform into foam cells. And of course, that can lead to significant pathology in the blood vessels. Some of these granules, when they're released, may cause erosion of endothelial cells. Mast cells may be involved in modulating responses to bacterial infections. Mast cells themselves may phagocytize bacteria as part of antigen processing. They can phagocytize and destroy the bacteria, but they can also release some of these granules, which will signal a T cells and B cells to mount a more significant immune response. Mast cells might also stimulate neutrophil activation. Neutrophils, as you know, might phagocytize bacteria. Neutrophil activation may also be important in the body's response, say, to breaking down venoms from an insect bite. So there are a lot of interactions between mast cells and other cells and connective tissues. And sometimes we can look at mast cells kind of like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So mast cells do important good things for us, but sometimes the reactions of mast cells lead to consequences that are not so good. So as we've suggested, mast cells can recruit neutrophils for antibacterial activity. They can coordinate immune responses of lymphocytes, may stimulate antigen processes. They can induce angiogenesis, maybe induce clot removal after wound healing. They can be mitogenic for cells in wound healing, and they may dampen down uh, responses if you get, say, an insect bite from the venom. Uh, so those are all good things. On the other hand, mast cell activity can lead to capillary permeability and edema. Significant release of the mast cell granules can trigger allergic reactions and even anaphylaxis, which might lead to an individual's death. A little bit milder, but still not necessarily a good consequence of mast cell activity may induce uh, skin rashes like hives, maybe other nerve-induced disorders. Mast cells may be involved in the release of lipids from LDLs that can lead to endothelial cell damage and arthrosclerotic deposits. It's even been suggested in MS patients, stress may lead to the release of stress hormone, which can activate mast cells to release interleukins and vascular endothelial cell growth factor that may even compromise the blood-brain barrier in patients with MS. So mast cells can do a lot of harmful things as well as a lot of good things. So the so-called Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde analogy. Adipose cells actually make up a specialized type of connective tissue, adipose. Adipose cells are very large cells. They're usually between 50 to 150 uh, microns in diameter. The image shown here are white fat cells. They have a typical signet ring appearance, that is the nucleus being pushed just to one side because these white fat cells have a very large lipid droplet that pushes all the cytoplasmic materials to the periphery. Adipocytes are considered resident cells within connective tissue. Adipose tissue has a lot of vascularity. You can see so a fairly large size arteriole here, as well as some much smaller blood vessels. Adipocytes can store and mobilize triglycerides, so they're involved in lipid metabolism. The image here shows white fat, also called uniblocular fat. We can contrast this so-called unilocular or white fat with what's called multilocular or brown fat, which is an image shown here on the bottom. But I want to caution you, immature white fat has the appearance of multilocular brown fat. True brown fat has specialized enzymes in the, in the cells called thermogens. Uh, these thermogens uncouple oxidative phosphorylation from ATP production, so it allows the fat cells to generate heat 
adipocytes can increase either in cell number or cell size. So you can see either hypertrophy or hyperplasia of adipocytes. White fat and brown fat cells are thought to be derived from different cell lineages. And indeed, it's thought that there's a perivascular stem cell, which under the influence of certain transcription factors, gives rise to white fat cells. On the other hand, stem cells for brown fat are thought to be related to skeletal muscle myogenic progenitor cells. And again, a different set of transcription factors are thought to stimulate the development of the stem cells for brown fat. But there is something it's rather interesting, and this is relatively new, uh, and people call this transdifferentiation or interconversion of white fat to brown fat. It's been shown in experimental animals that if they're exposed to cold or to vigorous exercise, there may be some of this interconversion of white fat to brown fat. And this is intriguing because if one could figure out how to harness this interconversion, one might have a potential treatment for obesity because the brown fat cells, by generating heat, are essentially burning calories. Adipose as a tissue, we don't give it much consideration in the histology course, but you're certainly going to consider adipose tissue in relation to biochemistry and physiology because adipose tissue is very important for energy homeostasis and for endocrine-paracrine regulation of energy metabolism. And some authors are now suggesting that there's maybe a brain-gut adipose axis that can regulate energy metabolism and may regulate the amount of adipose that individuals maintain and hence may be involved in regulation of our weight. So these are three different images from the textbook that we use in our course and I'm not going to really discuss them here but I just want you to understand adipose tissue, the individual cells in adipose tissue can synthesize and secrete a lot of different signaling molecules, cytokines, and even some hormones. The interplay of these molecules and hormones they relate to obesity for example, hormones like ghrelin are thought to play a role in short-term regulation that relates to appetite and metabolism. So maybe a short-term weight regulation on a daily basis. On the other hand, hormones like leptin might influence weight regulation in relation to appetite and metabolism over months or years. It's interesting to speculate on possible links between obesity, inflammation, and diabetes. So it's thought, for example, that an increase in adipocyte cell size may induce the cells to release inflammatory chemicals, and this may trigger insulin resistance. These inflammatory chemicals may attract macrophages into the connective tissue. When fat cells become too large, they're going to rupture. Macrophages are going to arrive and clean up the debris. Inflammatory chemicals may induce stem cells to mature to macrophages. It turns out the percentage of macrophages in adipose tissue seems to increase in obese mice, perhaps resulting in an increase in inflammation, which may lead ultimately to things like insulin resistance. These observations suggest that adipocytes may enjoy a certain amount of plasticity, which is beginning to suggest that adipocytes are going to become more and more important in our understanding of the regulation of energy metabolism. I want to conclude this podcast by just highlighting a couple of other connective tissue diseases that you may encounter in your training. Connective tissue diseases of, say, elastic fibers. You're going to talk about emphysema. Basically, you have excess neutrophil elastase, which is released 
uh, is a result of chronic irritation. This will overwhelm natural inhibitors of the neutrophil elastase. This will result in destruction of alveolar walls, for example. Marfan syndrome is a defect in the fibrillin gene. Basically, the defect in the fibrillin gene alters the hydroxyproline content of elastin, and that may lead to defects in blood vessel walls and aneurysms. There's some collagen fiber diseases. Scurvy is a vitamin C deficiency that can lead to failure of cross-linking of tropocollagen molecules. Rheumatoid arthritis, there may be an excess of collagenase and protease in synovial joints. Sometimes uh, you see collagen fiber diseases that lead to keloid formation. This is excess of uncontrolled collagen synthesis. It often occurs after injuries, and you'll see lots of uh, scars that may form on a patient's face or neck, especially after injuries like burns. And I want to point out that each of these connective tissue diseases that we've just talked about essentially affects the ability of fibrocytes or fibroblasts to make extracellular matrix components.